Yes, you just stumble on. So welcome everybody to the 2022 um, annual Ridi Lecture uh, hosted by the Medievalists in the English Department at the University of York. Um, we're super excited that we're back in person face to face and it's a wonderful kind of coming out of the pandemic because Jane was our guest the year of the pandemic. <laughs> um, and it just didn't seem possible to have the Ridi Lecture that year and then it wasn't possible for Jane last year so we're really excited that we're here in person and we have Jane who we were supposed to have on the other side of the pandemic. Um, we've got a large audience online as well, um, and a good size, a face-to-face -face audience, which is really exciting as well. Um, I just want to give people uh, who are online as well as people who are in the room, um, as it's standard with um, lectures of this nature, we're not going to have a formal Q&A with the webinar at the end. Um, so once Jane's talk is over, we'll be closing down the webinar, but we invite people who are here in the room to, to just um, stay around for a moment and we'll have a moment for informal chat conversations, questions. Jane, though, has been struggling with her voice, so um, there may be more or less informal conversation with Jane, depending on her voice um, at the end. Um, but anyway, it gives me enormous pleasure to finally get to introduce Jane um, to give this year's Ridi Lecture. Uh, Professor Jane Gilbert at UCL in the Department of Modern French, French, French. French. it's, sorry, I'm in Department of French. Jane works really um, across French and English literature of the high and late Middle Ages. Um, and Jane was one of my earliest editors, and I always think of her as her, one of my most probing and my, kind of going between big questions and minutiae detail. Um, it's, it's, scarred is not the right word. I mean, it wasn't scarred, it was in the nicest possible fashion, but a real <clears throat> kind of critical acumen. And I guess one of the things I think that really distinguishes Jane's work, and I'll talk a little bit in a moment about <clears throat> some of her kind of highlight publications, but she's really a medievalist who not just crosses medieval French and medieval English and moves between canonical texts and texts you I have not heard of and makes them really exciting. But she's somebody who really works at the intersection of medieval literature and especially French critical theory and often using uh, medieval literary theory to push texts in ways that we wouldn't have been thinking about pushing them without uh, those critical tools. <clears throat> um, so that, I think it's a really exciting way of doing things. Most recently, um, Jane's been involved as the co-I in a massive project on med Fr medieval French francophone literature outside of France, which led to a wonderful OUP co-authored book entitled Medieval French Literary Culture Abroad. Before that, in a kind of prescient moment uh, for the pandemic, she wrote a wonderful monograph called Living Death. Um, <clears throat> But now, and, and you know, I'm not going to go over all the many, many different things in medieval French, in medieval English, in romance, in song, in historiography, um, in early photography, etc., that she's working on and writing about. But her current project is, uh, and that relates very much to the talk today, is called Form in Translation. And in particular, she's interested in how form translates in both texts and manuscripts. And you can get a clear sense here, obviously, with her wonderfully titled, What Do Brackets Want? That this is about form in translation uh, to manuscripts. And I partially know that having glanced through the PowerPoint before um, today's talk, but I'm delighted to turn you over to Jane. Um, Jane, good Thank luck. You. <laughs> I'll try and put this on. I don't know if it'll my, my phone will stay, but just to give myself an idea of uh, timing. So, um, thank you, Nicola. Thank you all for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, and particular thanks to Nicola and to Brittany and Gillian in the uh, Centre for Medieval Studies for organising it. Um, I'm really honoured to be lecturing um, in Felicity Riddy's name. Felicity was the external examiner on my PhD back in 1993. <laughs> Um, and has always been one of my role models for what women can achieve in academia and for what academic leadership can achieve. So, um, and it's always such a pleasure to be in York, I think at the heart of UK medieval studies. And hello to everyone or possibly anyone online. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming. 
And I'm also, I should say, I'm also very grateful to Fordham University in New York, who awarded me a visiting medieval fellowship uh, for 2021 to 22. So I worked on writing up this piece in the wonderful surroundings of New York City and with Fordham support. Uh, rather less wonderfully, I also managed to catch COVID and um, my voice hasn't really recovered, as you can probably hear from the slight croakiness. This is the first time I've done anything like this also generally for three years, so um, bear with me. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to talk about brackets in medieval manuscripts, that is, marks made on the manuscript page that connect particular words or items to each other. Now, this graphic device is in some ways familiar to us now and easily overlooked, but modern readers can also, I think, be surprised by some of the ways in which brackets were used in medieval manuscripts. And this surprise might help us to think about what using them did to the ways in which some medieval people thought about written texts and about other things. Many of you here and online will know that medieval brackets have been preoccupying me for some years now. I haven't really stopped talking about them for about the last four years. Um, and I owe many of you for helping me to work this through in discussions and for providing me with examples, which has been wonderful, actually, as a networking device. They're great. Um, I've discovered I'm far from the only person to find these devices fascinating and even charming. Um, but we do rather think of ourselves as a niche group, I have to say. Um, so it's nice to be able to put brackets centre stage. Now, the brackets that appear in medieval manuscripts have been discussed in several historically sensitive ways, uh, some of which I'll come to. But I'm going to begin with a dehistoricizing move by turning to the work of the art theatrist W.J.T. Mitchell, um, and in particular to his... Okay. Okay, hang on. Uh, that is that one, isn't it? No, it's not working. Oh, okay, got it. All right, it's the wheel. <laughs> In particular, to his uh, to his, his brilliant essay collection um, published in two thousand and four, entitled "What Do Pictures Want." Now, Mitchell argues that the linguistic turn that dominated the earlier decades of the 20th century has been giving, giving way since at least the last quarter of that century uh, to a pictorial turn. Whereas the linguistic turn enshrined linguistics as queen of the sciences and imposed language-based models on many other cultural areas, the, the pictorial turn is preoccupied with visual culture. And the pictorial turn declares the autonomy and the specificity of the visual, um, aims to liberate the visual from subordination to language and to models derived from language, uh, and norms of that. Um, like, like many modern artists then, Mitchell proclaims the untranslatability of the visual work and of its impact. And he writes about the peculiar power that visual phenomena have to move, incite, and even command us about their power to intervene in our world and to shape our audiences, their audiences and creators, and about the fears that those powers inspire in us. This sensitivity to the powers of the visual is not a new thing, Mitchell insists. Pictorial turns have happened before and will happen again. Uh, rewardingly for medievalists, one of his examples is the, uh, this uh, icon, uh, 11th century icon uh, of Christ in a manuscript, which, as you can see, has uh, incited readers to, um, the people who've seen it, to, um, to touch it, to, to, to scrape it, to do other things to it. So it's been in, invited contact. It's had that power of making people do things. Um, and if anxiety about the power of images is not new, neither is it outmoded. Um, as modern subjects, Mitchell's own students are highly skeptical about the power of images, but they're still uncomfortable when he asks them to mutilate a photograph of someone that they love. Which is very funny in this book. <laughs> um, so confronted with the irreducible and, and sometimes inscrutable power over us of visual phenomena, Mitchell suggests that we need to explore non-linguistic models. And in what do pictures want, his preferred model is that of the living organism. He proposes, in fact, that we should consider pictures to be, and I quote, something like life forms, driven by desires and appetites. These desires and appetites may address or otherwise impact on humans, but without necessarily being human desires. 
Moreover, Mitchell claims this quasi-living status, not only for high art, but also for all forms of visual culture, however mundane. Following his example, I want to claim it for the brackets in medieval manuscript. Brackets are commonly treated in ways that subordinate them to language, for instance, as punctuation or as paratext. Um, but they are a visual device, and as such, they are eligible for Mitchell's revisionism. Now, it's become a pretty familiar move uh, to set out to demolish the traditional hierarchy between the human and the non-human domains, to argue that things have agency and that they can, in Mitchell's words, absorb and be absorbed by human subjects in processes that look suspiciously like those of living things. We accept today that human beings are hybrids whose constitution incorporates and is incorporated by non-human and even non-animate beings. Um, which we recognize as sufficient actors and agents in their own right. I mean, actually, we might find arguments like this to be more palatable when we're talking about everyday objects or technologies than when we're talking about high art, uh, where they carry, I think, a whiff of old fashioned elitism. But that uh, whiff in itself in Mitchell's writing actually helps us, I think, to recover the strangeness and the outrageousness of what it is that he's proposing. Okay. But it shouldn't be too normalized. Because for Mitchell, all arguments of this kind are instances of the vitalist fantasy that is his object of study. That is the dream of the world's liveliness, which is also, of course, a simple acknowledgement of fact. So his embrace of living images and mine of living brackets is intended to foreground questions about how fantasy, desire and the unconscious play in the entanglement of people and things, these specific things. Now, to demonstrate how applicable much of Mitchell's writing is to medieval brackets, uh, I have replaced Mitchell's term picture with brackets in this passage on my next slide, uh, in which he justifies asking the question what pictures want. So the idea is to make brackets less scrutable, less transparent. Also to turn analysis of brackets towards questions of process, affect, and to put in question the spectator position. What does the bracket want from me or from us or from them or from whomever? Who or what is the target of the demand stroke desire stroke need expressed by the bracket? One can also translate the question, what does this bracket lack? What does it leave out? What is its area of erasure? Its blind spot, its anamorphic blur. What does the frame or boundary exclude? What does its angle of representation prevent us from seeing and prevent it from showing? What does it need or demand from the beholder to complete its work? Now, Mitchell offers various answers to the question of what pictures might want. Uh, writing about Steven Spielberg's film AI with its futuristic Pinocchio, he proposes that, and again I quote, uh, the answer in this instance is clear. Pictures want to be loved and to be real. In a different essay, he approaches the problem via Chaucer's Wife of Bath's Tale and suggests that what images really want is, again, quote, a, a kind of mastery over the beholder. Now, what brackets want, I think, might be something like both of these. But let's say for the moment that brackets want humans to use brackets. And more than that, they want us to feel that we are bracket people. <laughs> that we are willing candidates for and even seekers after hybridization with them. And I again adapt Mitchell when he adds that obviously asking what brackets want also requires us to ask what it is that we want from brackets. Brackets want, need, and desire people to value, embrace, and pursue them. And this has both utilitarian and non-utilitarian sides. So I'm going to talk first about the utilitarian side, about what brackets allow humans to achieve that they might not have done otherwise. So uh, this section is on the usefulness of brackets. Now, understanding of medieval bracketing practices has been enormously advanced by Isla Tevin Ezra's 2020 monograph, Lines of Thought, Branching Diagrams, and the Medieval Mind. And this book is an absolute joy to read. Um, and I'm only going to pick out a few of uh, Evan Ezra's points about the usefulness uh, of brackets, which I'm then going to try and filter through Mitchell's lens. Okay. Um, so Evan Ezra focuses on what she calls a horizontal tree diagrams, or HTs. You have some examples there. Now, thousands of HTs survive in learned medieval manuscripts in a wide range of disciplines, including law, theology, grammar, rhetoric, poetics, natural sciences, medicine, and philosophy. Most HTs are informal productions added by readers 
in the margins of an authoritative text, such as Aristotle's Organon or uh, Peter Lombard's Sentences, where you can see them here, sort of all over the, uh, the page. Um, uh, in, in, in these cases, they serve to analyze, to abstract, and to visualize the underlying structure and the internal relations. In Evan Ezra's words, readers employed HTs to orient themselves within long and highly complex texts, to reconstruct those texts as reasoned, hierarchically conceived constructions, to penetrate their meaning, and then to compose new texts as authors. Because HTs, and again I quote, uh, enabled people consciously to conceive of structures of increased complexity beyond what can be simply hosted in one's mind, they are an external cognitive uh, aid that extends human reasoning powers, much as writing has done for millennia or as computers do today. And like writing on computers, HTs serve, and again Evan Ezra's words, to package procedures and ideas and thus let them travel independently and land in other contexts. Also like these other technologies, HT diagramming is no timeless and intuitive device. Evanesra shows that it was a central part of the training delivered by the medieval schools. Medieval brackets are embedded in this specific educational regime and the habits of mind that it inculcated. Between the mid 12th and the 15th centuries, HTs were a vital analytical tool for educated people and they inevitably structured both the way in which they thought and the thinkers themselves. Now, Evan Ezra considers that HT diagramming is above all an active practice. To produce an HT diagram is to reflect critically on the authoritative text and to experiment with different ways of analyzing and representing it. HT diagramming helps readers to achieve an in-depth understanding of the ideas and arguments that a text puts forward and of the ways in which it puts those forward. Moreover, it encourages them to intervene actively in the intellectual tradition by passing the received text onwards in a revised form. Um, she notes that HTs are rarely copied between exemplars. Instead, they're generated anew and differently. And on this slide, you can see uh, these are her transcriptions and translations of the same bit of text but the way that it appears in two quite different manuscripts. So the analysis is quite different. And it, it's very rare to find them being copied across. You did them again. So HTs imply a kind of dialogue, interaction. And Evan Ezra includes in her book, actually HTs of her own chapters and arguments. This is my next slide. Um, you can see this is on the left is, is chapter one, and then there is chapter two uh, laid out like uh, and she invites her readers to send her, them her effort, their efforts. You can send in your own efforts if you want to. So again, this, there's something about this um, that is remarkably interactive, I think. And especially what I want to get across is the intimacy of this, I think. Um, HTs let us get up close and personal with desirable texts and desirable authors. Uh, they help us to internalize and absorb their procedures uh, and to feel that we've joined a kind of textual community of imitators and disciples. And for all of this, we need, first of all, to get intimate with HD diagramming. And this is one reason why I've kept Ezra's shorthand HT for the kind of familiarity that it, you know, they're horizontal trees, but I call them HTs, uh, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, HTs really come alive when we use them actively, or to put it another way, when we let them use us actively lending them our bodies and minds as prostheses for actions that only they can perform. And this is what it means to become bracket people. Now, in fact, HTs represent only a narrow range of basic operations. They work to distinguish and to group phenomena in preparation for them to be categorized, labeled, ordered, and hierarchized. These are the Aristotelian methods of medieval scholasticism. Um, but Evan Ezra stresses that medieval HTs combine these operations in ways that achieve great flexibility, <laughs> finesse, and importantly, creativity. And my next slide is a quotation from her. Hierarchy and order carry to the modern ear negative associations of stiffness. And one could get an impression of a culture favoring rigidness and strictness. But the image of this habit, as it's been unraveled in lines of thought, this is right at the end of the book, is of the playfulness and creativity of organizing and restructuring. Mini structures repeat, but larger ones never. What we've seen throughout is not one tree reflecting a well-organized universe, but multiple trees of ever-changing and growing minds. 
Medieval people were fascinated by structure and order, but more so by constructing and reconstructing, ordering and reordering. So one of the things that HT seemed to want is for us to experiment with new ways of thinking about the world, ways that will no doubt involve more HTs. Now, this generative power of HTs may be connected to the fact that they are, as Evan Ezra shows, betwixt and between various conventional categories of Western thinking. An HT diagram is not only composed of both verbal elements and visual ones, brackets, but it fully intertwines them, and much more so than a vertical tree diagram. Um, unlike vertical trees, horizontal ones involve partial syntax. Uh, and again, Evan Ezra comments that her students find HGs very challenging to produce, both because of the horizontal orientation and because of the discursive element. Compared to vertical trees, HTs are much more and differently engaged with sentence structures and with regular reading patterns, although they are crucially not contained within those linguistic models. HTs are, or were, not simply another version of the arborescent thinking critiqued by Deleuze and Guattari, but bring to light more flexible and complex relationships and more subtle and iterative ways of thinking about connection and sequence. And there'd be more thinking to do, I think, about how, the, how this worked and what this was like, the cognitive differences, and about how the shift in the 12th century West from the older practice of vertical tree diagramming to HTs materially changed the ways in which logical analysis was related to everyday language processing. And to think as well about how that relationship changed again since HTs fell out of general use somewhere around the middle of the 18th century, according to Evan Ezra. So um, HTs represent, uh, in Evan Ezra's words, then a unique interface between written language and conceptual thought, between formulation of ideas and full <laughs> verbal articulation. Connecting brackets and language makes new ideas possible. And I'm going to turn next to a family relation of HTs, the variety of brackets known as poetic braces, in which the interaction between brackets and language, the visual and the verbal, is an important driver of aesthetic and formal meaning. Uh, and my mascot here is the living bracket, that, as you've seen, animating the opening page of The Antas of Arthur. Um, so, poetic braces, then. Now, as I've been arguing with Evan Ezra's very considerable help, um, medieval bracket people were a very particular human-non-human -human hybrid, trained and excited by brackets to think in specific ways, some of which modern readers share, uh, others of which have been lost. And let's keep this in mind as we turn to poetic braces, that is, graphic lines connecting blocks of verse, as found in medi many medieval manuscripts. Poetic braces, I want to argue, endow verse with the qualities of HTs that I've been highlighting from Evan Ezra's discussion, and in ways that are specifically poetic, both in the narrower sense of poetry and in the wider understanding of poesis as artistic making. And exactly that's precisely what they add to it, if you like, is that wider dimension. Because one of the things that they do is that they provide a critical reflection on and intervention in poetic form and meaning. So they provide a language art with a visual meta language. And I think the consequences of that are really potentially quite vast. Um, that we, do, we are not trammeled by language in the form of reflection that is going on here, the inter whatever this would be, modal, medial, whatever. And they access different areas of human experience both as devices associated with conceptual analysis and abstraction, uh, HTs, and as autonomous beings endowed with the uncompromising, untranslatable demands of the visual, brackets bring something to poetry beyond what written words and sounds alone can access. They open poetic inventiveness up to dimensions beyond the verbal and the sonic and beyond the writing of words. Um, for the medieval bracket person, reading or writing braced verse, connects the poem up to more organs and senses than would uh, um, otherwise be involved. While at the same time, it sharply activates analytic, abstracting centers of the brain. So brackets want to augment prosthetically both our bodies and our minds. Bracketed poetry allows us to visit different places in what Heidegger called the house of being. So I'm going to look at three examples of bracketed verse, all as it happens late medieval, although there are earlier ones. And I want to highlight how the brackets increase our reading possibilities by the way in which they work with rhyme. Mm -hmm. 
because poetic braces highlight how words with similar sounds but different meanings occur in the same place in the poetic line. Um, and that by doing that, they're sort of sketching, sketching specific poetic forms. They have a very strong role to play in this issue of form. Now, using rhyme as the major structuring device in verse like this is a medieval invention of course, like HTs and poetic braces. It's not a feature of classical antique textual culture. Poetic braces work to draw out some of the implications that structural rhyme can have and that we might not think about otherwise. As other critics have also noted then, braced verse constitutes a concrete theory or rather varying theories about specifically medieval poetics or perhaps theorizing, theorization might be a better word. Sometimes in the vernacular, like my examples here, but some also often also in Latin. So my first example is a French translation of the Ave Maria, uh, Dieu vous sauve Marie, um, and yes, you've got the manuscript. Now, in order to pronounce this prayer in an orthodox manner, you need to know how to read this layout, uh, which Rhiannon Purdy termed graphic tail rhyme in her indispensable 2008 monograph, uh, Anglicising Romance. Graphic tail rhyme divides the text into, and we talk about this little text at the bottom, uh, into groups of three lines. Within each group, the line at the top of the left-hand column edge is read first, then that below it, and thirdly, the line that is set off to the right or displayed, which ideally is positioned between the first two lines. Is everybody clear on that, how that works? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I need a pointer somewhere. Um, okay, so that, that is graphic tail rhyme. Right? I mean, so in order to say this uh, in an orthodox manner, in a dogmatic manner. Um, but as Catherine Kirby Fulton pointed out in 2012, opening up Middle English manuscript, this layout also encourages the reader to experiment with the order in which they read the lines. Uh, and that's especially true when you remember the affordances of Evan Ezra's HT diagrams, uh, the aspect of reorganization and mobility that's going on in all of this. Um, poetic braces challenge us, even tease us, with the option of reordering the lines and the stanzas. In this particular poem, the displayed lines on the right actually fit grammatically if you insert them into the tercet at other points. You could put them in other places and play with alternative reading sequences. You could also try taking the three displayed lines as a freestanding monorhyme tercet uh, and the remainder as rhyming couplets. That would also work. So instead of dutifully following the line order of the original Latin, the poetic braces are encouraging readers to meditate experimentally on the meanings of this version of the Ave Maria, uh, to intervene in it textually and to speculate on its possible relationships to their own lives. The bracket people who are being interpolated here are pious lay readers in the high vernacular of old Anglo-French, who are being offered the active in-depth understanding towards which HTs work in learned scholastic manuscript. And along with that, they're being offered an enhanced, renewed and renewable affective engagement with a version of the holy text uh, through the medium of this poetry. Experimentation and display and ambiguity are also on display in my second example, um, which uh, can I, I'm sure it's about. Uh, this is a, a Tuscan sonnet by the Pisan poet Panuccio del Bagno. Now, this is a unique layout, although there are other things that are not as dissimilar from this as it might be. Um, and it focuses attention on the dazzling use of the device called equivocal rhyme. To pick up just one that's highlighted here, um, the brackets show how the same written and sonic form, so sovra in the first quatrain, uh, represents four distinct lexical items, which provide the last words of lines one and three and the first words of lines two and four. Uh, so I hope that's clear enough. <laughs> Absolutely clear, I'm sure, crystal. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, as, as Paolo Borsa shows, um, the, the brackets advance a series of poetic claims. Uh, they demand that we acknowledge the virtuosity of the poet. Uh, also the rich literary affordances of the language with which he's working and the poetic value of exploiting the ambiguities of meaning that are latent in that language's vocabulary and grammatical structures. 
you need to be a bracket person to respond to those demands, or perhaps you become one by embracing them. Which isn't to say that every educated medieval person responded positively. Dante rejected these practices uh, and equivocal rhyme um, and, and oriented Tuscan verse in a different direction towards a different poetics. And although equivocal rhyme continued to flourish in other Romance languages, such as Old French, um, it is, as far as I know, largely without brackets, at least in Old French. Uh, if anybody knows examples of Old French brackets, I'd be really, not Anglo-Norman Old French, I'd be really interested to hear. Um, however, poetic braces found a welcoming home, uh, in, if, if, even if Dante didn't like them, uh, they found a welcoming home in manuscripts produced in Britain and Ireland. And my final example it shows a manuscript of Earth a um, poem in Middle English and Latin, as discussed by, discussed by Marjorie Harrington. The layout assumes that bracket people can read both languages, or rather perhaps it shows that the brackets want them to be able to speak both languages, or are implying that they ought to be able to speak both languages, read both languages. Evidently, according to this, we are supposed to read a four-line section plus a two-line section in one language and then the other. Uh, so this is a sophisticated poetic structure. This is not just a scroll. Um, red brackets indicate that the Latin sections uh, use a long line with both medial rhyme and end rhyme. Uh, so this is different. It, although it's visually similar to Panuccio's sonnet, you don't read it in the same way. Um, you are reading this line. So oh, that one line, but the, the rhyme is in the middle, a Leonin rhyme, as well as a rhyme at the end. Um, and so, you know, the, the, like us as HTs adapt to different contexts, this, this adapts to different poetic forms. And indeed, it seems to generate different poetic forms. That's part of the point. Um, now, but so the Latin does that. In the Middle English, on the other hand, uh, you have the red brackets indicate the rhyme only at the line's end. Uh, what's really striking is that there's no graphic uh, recognition of the insistent iterations of the keyword earth. Um, although the word's appearances are densely patterned, as you can probably see here, it often comes back in anaphora, it, also come, it often comes back at the end of many of the first half lines, but they're not incorporated into the brackets, graphic visualization of poetic form, which instead emphasizes regular rhyme structures. The manuscript layout, therefore, creates a productive tension between, on the one hand, regular patterns highlighted by red brackets, and on the other, shifting, irregular rhythms seen in the writing and heard in the reading. Once more, we're being invited, if we're bracket people, to join a distinguished group of cultural producers and consumers who can reflect on the relations between the bracketed poem's components and on the implied poetic theory. As with all these brackets, moreover, we're being stimulated, nudged, even spurred, not to disappoint the poetic braces' clear expectation that we will behave like actors or agents, an experiment with reorganizing these components to produce new configurations of the sonic, verbal, and visual devices that this poetry is putting into play. Write the next one, that's always the uh, invitation. Reading or writing with poetic braces then spawns possibilities for alternative readings new analyses of the parts of a poem and new relationships between those parts. It encourages writers, copyists and readers to experiment formally, uh, to imagine differently not only what a particular poem might be doing or saying, but also what poetry itself might aspire to. In this particular, um, in this poetic braces are a clear debt to the cultural habit of producing HT diagrams. Uh, which embody, again, in Evan Ezra's words, both firm structure and alternative options of reading, and thereby open up new spaces for reflection, dialogue, and creativity. Do I say adding to language something that is not there otherwise? Okay, so, well, so far, so all quite lovely. All right, these are the positive affects and effects of brackets. Uh, but I want to shift back now to those elements of desire and the unconscious. Um, one of the major theorists of, de of desire, the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, debunks the common belief that desires must be rational or utilitarian. Desire, he says, often has little regard for the desire as well-being or for the greatest happiness of the greatest number. 
When St. Martin observes a beggar's inadequate clothing, he gives the beggar half of his own cloak. But Lacan observes, perhaps over and above that need to be clothed, the beggar was begging for something else. Namely that St. Martin either kill him or fuck him. In any encounter, there's a big difference in meaning between the response of philanthropy and that of love. Brackett seems to have cottoned onto the fact that humans want things that are tricky, troubling, and not straightforwardly good for them. Humans want to be bothered. If I'm not bothered, then I don't really care about something. So brackets make themselves bothersome in order to attract human interest and desire and to persuade us to use them and pursue them. So let's think then about some of the ways in which brackets are bothersome. Well, firstly, brackets are hard work and they are intrinsically risky. You risk failure. It's clear from many manuscripts that poetic braces make a page harder to design and to execute. And um, as you can see sort of in the top left hand here, they, there's, this, this happens all the time. They place stressful demands on planners, scribes, rubricators, and marginal commentators, as well as on readers. Um, and Purdy's has, book has an excellent chapter on this. Evidence of user difficulties, failed or abandoned experiments, and just mistakes, like in the bottom one there, where you can see someone has joined up the wrong, the things that don't rhyme, with the things that do rhyme. <laughs> Um, and this uh, happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, so th this, 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 is, this is very hard. It doesn't make any life easier for anybody. Moreover, it's very noticeable that as uh, organizing devices go, brackets are not resistant to breakdown. Indeed, they seem to court breakdown. Uh, this is a manuscript of uh, notes on Albert the Great. Um, I think as things get more complicated uh, in this, it becomes very difficult to work out where a bracketing relation goes or where it should, you know, where, what, what it's joining. Is it separating? Is it connecting? Is it sort of things? Things get out of control really quite quickly. Um, so brackets, again, you know, they connect where we want them to separate and they separate where we want them to connect. Um, relations that seem to point in one direction get reoriented. Brackets promise to clarify and order our world, therefore, may lead us into unwelcome byways. Seductive and frustrating help needs, brackets make their presence felt. If we don't notice them nowadays, it's because we're no longer bracket people, or at least not in the same way. Second point then, um, it's tempting to suggest that brackets encourage us to associate order as something desirable with abstraction, analysis, and the rational, and to assign the bothersome value of disorder to phenomena that are not abstract, unprocessed, or not rational, perhaps to the entire material world, certainly to the world of praxis with its mistakes, its failures, and its uh, idiosyncrasies. However, the positive as well as the negative aspects of brackets are in fact heavily invested in the material world. Analytic HTs bind the human intellect to external concrete realization. So, you know, you wouldn't get there where you've got to without the bracket. And that opens us to the possibility both of unlike, otherwise unlikely advances and to blunders or dead ends. And similarly, poetic braces link artistic meaning umbilically to bodily sounds, to writing and to manuscript layouts. One can't activate the new interconnections that braces make possible without laying oneself open to poor phrasing, mispronunciation, copying error, textual variation. Indeed, by encouraging experimentation, poetic braces may even encourage uh, mouvance and variance, you know, the sense to, to mess around with text in some way, to copy it differently every time. Um, thirdly, uh, part of the pleasure and the pain that brackets must have offered to medieval people who were living in this habitus must have derived from the opportunity to compete over the handling of brackets. Uh, who was best at tricky manuscript layouts, complex rhyme schemes, or analysis of a really difficult school text? Now, competition, of course, is all very well for those who excel, but what about the others? Both HTs and poetic braces encourage us to perform on people the same operations that we perform on texts, grouping, labeling, ordering, hierarchizing. In fact, Brackets invite us to grade people according to their relationship to brackets. 
Medieval brackets are or were a means to distinguish between those who could, can read and construct them, those who can analyze and parse well, even those who are able to see the manuscript, and those who cannot. And this fact must have affected, and that is shaped, developed and normalized, um, medieval bracket people's ideas about the relative value of different human activities, about human relations, and about the proper configuration of human societies. Brackets contribute to particular ideas about what the human ideally is, and to the exceptional status of certain humans. And some, though not all, of the losers and the winners, uh, as well as the winners in this contest, can also be considered to be bracket people, although they may have felt less positively about brackets than did defter individuals. The desires of brackets and the desire for brackets can torment as well as titillate. So, um, my conclusion then. Um, how, how, how can we model the relationship between brackets and humans, where both are subjects and objects of desire, though not necessarily the same desires? Well, following Mitchell, we can consider brackets as, uh, quote, co-evolutionary life forms, such as parasites or viruses, whether biological or digital. Although they depend on others for their subsistence, reproduction and diffusion, Parasites and viruses also reconfigure their hosts. Uh, in Mitchell's words, they change the way we think and see and dream. In this model, species survival requires the organism to propagate itself, which brackets achieve by changing as they migrate within and between manuscripts. The parasite or virus seeks also to be introduced to new hosts and to adapt to different environments. Accordingly, brackets spread from university to lay context, from Latin to several vernaculars, from scholastic works to a variety of texts, including some uh, poetic braces and some I haven't mentioned yet, such as music manuscripts or play scripts, where you find them an awful lot. And they were able to take advantage of local ecological niches, such as that in Britain and Ireland, evidently for poetic braces. But personally, I don't, well, I don't know about you, but I'm not really finding viruses a very attractive prospect for thinking with at the moment. <laughs> I have spared you the images I could have put up there of viruses and parasites, believe me. Um, so for a less paranoid account of the bracket human relationship, uh, we could turn to Donna Haraway um, and her companion species manifesto, subtitled Dogs, People and Significant Otherness, published in 2003 as a supplement to, and to some extent a replacement of, her cyborg manifesto of 1985. For Haraway, and I, this, reasons for putting this quote, inhabitants of technoculture become who we are in the symbiogenetic tissues of nature cultures. It's the hybridity there that I really like. And uh, I take this to mean that the organic and the technical and the natural and the cultural, not to mention the animate and the inanimate and the physical and the non-physical intertwine in every being, whether human, dog or bracket, mm -hmm. at both individual and collective scales. Everybody is a hybrid. Although her focus is on dogs and people, Haraway prompts me to suggest that brackets and people might also be companion species who affect each other in ways that are, in Haraway's terms, not especially nice. The relationship is full of waste, cruelty, indifference, ignorance and loss, as well as a joy, invention, labor, intelligence and play. If we construe brackets and humans as companion species, we highlight how they form each other in what Haraway calls co-constitutive relationships in which none of the partners pre-exists the relating and the relating is never done once and for all. And this model puts the complex relationship rather than the participants at its center. Um, and that was, yes, at the center. That one. Uh, and that has the advantage of highlighting how interests may be shared and contested and how strong complex affects arise requiring negotiation and compromise allowing for changes in the distribution of power. Haraway's model, in fact, foregrounds the political and diplomatic issues of the partnership between humans and brackets. And this, I think, allows us to address some of Mitchell's important questions about the blind spots and erasures that come with brackets, while also acknowledging how creative, mutually beneficial and vitalizing, and how tantalizing, frustrating and disappointing that partnership could be. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much, Jane, for a really, really wonderful <laughs> and kind of dazzling talk, um, visually dazzling as well. I've always thought of myself as a bracket person because I like lots of dashes and, and brackets. Now I'm kind of worried about being a bracket person because clearly I can't compete with medieval bracket people at all. Um, but I think it was such a wide ranging, and I mean, again, the, the minutiae of the detail to these really much bigger intellectual questions. I mean, questions about how are we theorizing poetics through brackets, but how are these also habits of mind? So many questions about uh, how did people just actually read these things and these, uh, these extraordinary hierarchical dis distinctions between those who could read these and who couldn't. So thank you for giving us such a stimulating, challenging, eye-opening, um, titillating, <laughs> frightening paper. Um, it was really a wonderful way to come back to the face-to-face -face Ritty lecture. So thank you again um, very, very much. And I'm going to turn the people off <laughs> online, but maybe one more round of applause. Um, <laughs> I'm in that. <laughs> turn us off.